Hello. So I've got something I think you're going to be interested in. So in the next Physics Frontiers, I'm going to be talking with James Owen Weatherall about the limits to gravity theories, the limits to general relativity. I think that'll be really interesting. He's a philosopher at the University of California at Irvine. What I think is going to be interesting here is that at the same time I was reading papers for that interview, I was listening to a discussion between Agnes Callard of the University of Chicago and um, Tyler Cowan of George Mason University. And it was a wide ranging discussion. It had nothing to do with physics, but in the middle of it, in the middle of it, Tyler Cowan mentioned the philosophy of physics. In fact, he wanted to know something about how do philosophers of physics and physicists get along, all right? And I thought that was really interesting, partially because of all of the places that I had seen philosophers interacting with physicists since starting the show. So as a physicist, I'd never seen, I'd never seen philosophers, but, after starting the show, I'd seen a lot of interesting things. Uh, one interesting thing that we'd seen was in our retro causality episode. We'd seen Ian Hacking working with Kenneth Wharton on retro causality, right? That was the whole point. I'd also seen some other things where we had some other shows planned. We were also planning on talking about prime reversal symmetry, and there was a really great exchange between Brian Roberts and Abe Ashtikar on that. And I'd seen a little more in different places in the foundations of physics. So I thought Tyler Cowan's question was very interesting. Uh, it was a question that was on my mind for a different reason altogether. So I'm going to talk with James Owen Weatherall about that. First, I wanted to just show you the clip from that particular YouTube video from this Night Owls thing that Agnes Coward does, just so that you saw exactly what Tyler Cowan said. Okay. Mm. Let me read you a quote. This is by you actually and um, pointed my directed my attention to this quote from Bruno Latour. This gets us back to the topic of what is wrong with philosophers. Since you wanted to, I have a list. Um, oh, okay. Oh, you have a list. No, well, let me read you the yes. quote first. You can agree or disagree, and then you can give me the li your list. Um, I've always found that philosophy. So Bruno Latour. Uh, this is uh, someone posted this on Twitter, but uh, I have always found that philosophy in America has become something like golf a highly skilled, highly competitive outdoor activity, but somewhat boring for the public to watch and of no relevance whatsoever. <laughs> it's related to my list. Okay, go ahead. So let me hear the list. There's three points, but rather than me running through all three, let's take them one by one. Uh, the first is I don't think philosophers have succeeded very well in integrating themselves into real world processes where they get useful feedback to be on learning loops. So if I think of economists, and again, I recognize not always for the better, but they work for governments, they work for the Fed, they work on Wall Street, more and more work for tech companies, they're in academia, they work on aid projects, they work for multilaterals, and there's a feedback in learning loops which are very, very powerful. When I think like where do philosophers interact with the so-called real world, I see a lot of that in biomedical ethics. I see much, much less of it in other areas. I do see a good and useful trend in philosophy to have areas like say philosophy of physics where the person doing it actually knows a lot about physics. That's great, but just from my distanced vantage point, I don't actually see people doing physics coming to the philosophers asking them for help. And that to me says something. So too many of you are outside of learning loops where data and feedback are making it better and better at a pretty rapid rate. That's my first criticism of philosophers. All right, so very interesting comment. And since I had James Owen Weatherall coming on the show anyway, I thought it'd be really great to ask him about this particular quote. And that's what I'm going to ask him to do right now, okay? Cool. How do you interact with physicists and what do you each get out of it? 
Um, yeah. Oh, so I I interact with physicists a lot. Um, I uh, have published I don't know somewhere between a, a dozen and and fifteen papers with uh, with physicists. I mean, I, I did a PhD in physics before getting into philosophy. Um, the uh, um, the kind of work that I've done with physicists um, ranges from work that's I think. Um, primarily motivated by questions in, in physics, but where, uh, you know, there's some, some mutual interest with, um, you know, with me or with some, some group, I, you know, I have a group of graduate students who also collaborate with, uh, with physicists and with, with me. Um, uh, up to uh, issues that are, you know, really foundational issues, issues in mathematical or conceptual foundations of, of physics that um, uh, are um, it's kind of at, at the interface. I mean, they're, they're, they're maybe, almost in, um, primarily of, of philosophical interest, but not entirely of philosophical interest. Um, and so, you know, let me, let me give uh, two examples here. Um, one recent paper that um, uh, is uh, forthcoming now in uh, monthly notices of Royal Astronomical Society um, is uh, co-authored me, one of my students, and then a, a group of, of physicists here at UCI, where we do a code comparison, um, comparing two different uh, implementations of self-interacting dark matter. Um, in uh, you know uh, different um, uh, gravity solvers, um, so you know this is this is a a physics question, really an, a, a, an astrophysics and simulation question. Um, but it's actually it was motivated originally by a philosophical question, which is how are we supposed to uh, assess the um, uh, reliability of large scale simulations um, in, cosmo in cosmology and astrophysics in particular, but you know more generally in climate modeling and, and so on. Um, and there's a you know a, a literature and philosophy about what you can learn from code comparisons, and so our group thought, well, um, we think there are things you can learn from code comparisons that are a bit different from the the sorts of things that that people have debated previously. Um, but let's figure it out. How are we going to figure it out? Let's team up with some some astrophysicists and uh, do a code comparison. So what did they get out of it? Well. They got a really talented grad student to run a whole bunch of simulations. Uh, they got a, a paper and MNRIS out of it. Um, I think they got a bunch of really interesting and useful conversations about just what the methodology was, what we were trying to do, how this was different from other code comparisons. Um, and so, you know, they got most of the things they would get out of a normal collaboration with a, another group, plus maybe a little bit more. We got a lot of information out of it um, uh, by, you know, Seeing how this actually works, getting um, a lot of you know hands-on experience and and feedback from some people who are working in the the area, uh, so that's one example. You know, an, another example, totally different. This is a paper that came out a few years ago in a, a journal called um, in, in Communications and Mathematical Physics, which is sort of a, a, a pretty good um, a mathematical physics journal. Um, that I co-authored with a mathematical physicist named uh, Bob Garrosh on the uh, status of the, um, the geodesic principle in general relativity, right? And so this is sort of the generalization of Newton's first law to general relativity. It says that, you know, small, basically point particles um, in the absence of external force are going to follow uh, time like geodesics. Um, this is something that people have, have worked on just purely out of physical interest since uh, at least the 1920s when Einstein and Gromer published on it, people have been trying to derive the geodesic principle from other principles of general relativity. Um, we made some contributions. We, we have a new way of, of thinking about this as sort of a, a, a general class of, of theorems that connect this problem up to more realistic matter theories uh, at a greater level of generality than people have done before. I think it's pretty mathematically interesting and I think it's of, of physics uh, interest. Um, is it in a tradition that has been primarily physicists working? But I got interested in it because a bunch of philosophers had stepped in and argued that the fact that the geodesic principle was a theorem of general relativity um, was an important difference between general relativity and Newtonian gravitation. And that leads to the question of, well, in just what sense is the uh, geodesic principle actually a theorem of general relativity and not a theorem of Newtonian gravitation. So I, I worked on that for a while. And then, you know, Bob and I had had these results that we that we published. And so again, you know, what did Bob get out of this? Well, you know, he had a collaborator. I proved some theorems. He proved some theorems. We were a nice paper together. Um, what does the, you know, 
philosophical community get out of it? I mean, this is a pretty technical paper. I think it's probably of, of more direct interest to to uh, to physicists, um, but philosophers, you know, cite it pretty often and, and engage with it. Um, so I think of this as just a totally ordinary kind of uh, collaboration. I don't think of this as something that's it, it's certainly interdisciplinary because the kinds of things that are motivating the different collaborators are a bit different in each case. We're bringing different kinds of skills. Um, but I, I don't think that we need to think of these kinds of, of projects as happening at some grand scale where, you know, Aristotle and Einstein are, are, are meeting, you know, maybe with Picasso or something like this at a, you know, French cafe. And, and I think there's a play, it's not Aristotle, but um, uh, anyway, um, you know, we don't need to think about this as sort of these giant meetings. I mean, there, there's a lot of overlap between philosophy of physics, foundations of physics, mathematical physics, theoretical physics, um, people who are interested in methodological issues in physics and general philosophy of science. And a lot of places where uh, um, that overlap can be, you know, lead to really fruitful, fruitful projects. Excellent, excellent. I did, I did read a couple of your other papers when I was preparing for this, and they did. Um, well, I mean, they looked much more mathy than the one we're going to talk about in a few minutes, right? It, and they looked very mathy. They looked theorem proof, sort of mathy, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I'm not talking like there's a lot of equations. I'm saying. You know, you, you have a theorem, you go through a proof, and you're supposed to figure out what's going on from the proof sort of thing. It's, it's very, um, it's very technical. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it's very, yeah. Very, um, it's very strong. Okay, well, I think that's um, really what I wanted well, to I, hear. No? I wonder, can I, I mean, maybe just make one other comment, though. Oh, certainly. Well, it's, it's that, there, you know, there's a, a social dynamics issue. So... The number of, of physicists is uh, much greater than the number of uh, philosophers. Okay, so I mean, if we're thinking about this as physicists, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> the number of philosophers of physics divided by the number of physicists is approximately zero, right? And so the, the the number of physicists you're going to encounter who have had some kind of fruitful interaction with a philosopher, much less two interactions, such that you know, if the first one wasn't totally fruitful, they're going to have an opportunity to give someone a second chance, is going to be very small compared to the number of philosophers of physics who are having fruitful interactions with physicists. Um, now, I think particularly high profile physicists may be somewhat more likely to be approached by philosophers, you know, people who, who don't have a, a total, totally clear picture of, of uh, everything that's going on in every physics department around the world, right? I mean, some people are gonna stand out because of their public profile. So they might be more likely, someone like Ashtakar, someone like Carlo Rovelli, you know, who are sort of relatively public figures, um, some popularizers, Sean Carroll, for instance, is very, very active with uh, philosophers of physics. Um, in fact, is about to, to take up a, um, a position that's half in a philosophy department. Um, uh, and, you know, and then other, other people who, uh, you know, um, who, you know, Klaus Kiefer wrote a textbook on quantum gravity, and he gets invited to a lot of philosophy conferences and seems very happy to talk to philosophers of, of physics. Um, but I think most working physicists aren't going to encounter philosophers of physics um, just on, for numbers reasons. Um, and so I think, it's, I think it's not inaccurate to say most physicists aren't really interacting very much with philosophers or aren't, um, you know, don't really have philosophers of physics on their radar, maybe don't really know what, what we do. Uh, but I don't think that we can infer from that that um, what philosophers of physics are doing is universally irrelevant to what physicists are doing. I think that there's this sort of big zone of um, uh, mutual interest um, with different perspectives that can be pretty fruitful. Okay, that's it. So I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed James Owen Weatherall's take on how physicists and philosophers of physics actually get along. I'll talk to him more. I actually have talked to him, but I'll talk to him more about the limits to general relativity in the next podcast, and that'll be coming up in less than a month. And I'd like to thank him for doing this, and I'll get to thank him again for that later on. But I hope this has been useful for you and um, interesting. Okay. So thanks. Bye now.